just meant, you know, human being, trust, honesty, um, love for the game, love for St. Louis, love for the fans, love for Gussie. Um, it just was a beautiful thing every day to go to work and be with, with him and Red Shandies and Jack Buck. And, you know, I'm kind of, it's obviously a sad day, but at the same time, I'm, I'm happy for Wyatt. He gets to go be with his friends, you know, he gets to be with Stan. You know, he gets to be with all the all the greats, all the Hall of Famers, Gibby and Lou and, and all of them up there now. So along with Mantle and Yogi and Ted Williams, you know, plus his, his idol idol is Casey Stengel, you know. I have a I have a picture in my house signed by him where he's on a little scooter with Casey Stengel driving it and Whitey's on the back of him holding on, wow. you know. So um, those are all my motorcycle days, but. Uh, we got some fishing going on. You and Whitey did some of that. Did a lot, of, a lot of that, and I appreciated that because it just was something he really enjoyed, and he knew a lot of fishing holes, especially over in the Illinois area over there where he's from. So I'd meet him at the ballpark. At, no, actually at a, a commuter lot out here, sometime at the ballpark, depending on where he wanted to go, and um, jump in the car at 4.30 in the morning. He would drive out there however long it took to get there, and he'd make sandwiches, um, some liver sandwiches with an onion about that thick with mustard and uh, I actually he's in the front on the trolling motor and I took a bite and I just I didn't like it you know but I didn't want to hurt his feelings so I kind of tossed it overboard and then as we went around the little lake like this we came back in there went the sandwich floating floating by and I was like oh man I hope he didn't see but how you're not going to see is it's like this big white sandwich and I want to hurt his feelings you know but I had beer to wash it down and everything at 4 3 in the morning then he'd go home we'd get back and we'd, he'd catch whatever fish we caught, he'd go up to his trailer, put the flatbed down, and he had a battery there with a, a carving knife, electric carving knife, he hooked up to the battery, and he'd carve the fish up and throw the guts in a bucket, and then ask me to take them down and feed them, you know, throw them into for the turtles, you know, and then he'd clean it up and then he'd go home, drop me off and say, go take a nap, and Mary Lou will have these ready for you in a milk container at your locker at the end of the game, frozen, you know, so they're really good, fresh, have your wife cook them up, and they were delicious, mm -hmm. they always were, but we always had fun and lost things, tip boats over and everything else and I really enjoyed that it, it kind of that along with like say going to Chicago and we went on the day of the game you know you went up there go to the ballpark play the game you don't have to worry about all the other stuff you know you got to spend an extra day with your family you know it's like uh, so um, Missouri it's still here and because you know just my memories are all here you yeah. know and uh, he he loved you even though you weren't whitey ball with all the speed you were the one guy that made it click he had to have you and he loved you well he he knew how all that stuff worked and uh, he knew me from the giant days because he traded for me and i finally got to see him when he wanted me asked me to move to first base he's like i know you played third base and they wanted to make you a third baseman in san francisco in the minor leagues he knew i played so he said that oh, first base would be no problem because i wanted to, i was playing right field when i got here it was Van Slyke, uh, Tito Landrum, and myself in right field. And he said, they don't want to platoon those guys, but he moved to first base, and I didn't want to. He says, well, I know you played third with the Giants in the minor leagues. Go play third for a little while, first base. If you don't like it, I'll get you out of here. I think I've told you that story a million times. But then I told him I didn't like it about halfway through spring training. And he says, well, you look like a natural over there. If you don't like it by the All-Star game, I'll get you out of there. And that, that was him in a nutshell, you know. And, you know, I had the closest seat in the house to watching Pendleton and Ozzy and um, Tommy Herr and McGee and, and just winning out in the field, you know, Vince Coleman with Danny Cox and Tudor and Andrew and just Bobby Forsh and all those guys. May some of those guys rest in peace that aren't with us anymore, Daryl Porter and, 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 and now the Rat, you know. So we always called him the Rat. We didn't call him the White Rat. We didn't call him White. We just said Rat, you know, just flat out. Final thought, what made him so smart? Why was he better than everybody else? I, I think it had a lot to do with Casey Stingle. You know, he knew how to run the clubhouse. I mean, think about it. You go to work your first day of spring training, and you get to the season, you get to St. Louis, clubhouse meeting, how, how we're going to run it, and it took about five seconds. You know, it's like, hustle, be here on time for, your, your, uh, for the training. And, I mean, if you have to get anything medically done, you know, be here early and get your work done, and hustle. That's it. That's all I. He's like. That's all I asked of you. He never said anything else. We had a great. He had a great clubhouse. Great group of guys. Treated us like men. And just go out and play. Lineup was the same every day, unless you were hurt or something. But basically, it was the same lineup every day. And the guys that were on the bench, which was smart, and a lot of people don't know that, Braun and Landrum or Van Syke or whoever he was platooning, 
they knew their role. They knew that um, Steve Brown knew that he was a pinch hit off the bench and a good one. And Tito Landrum knew he could take that role and then go play right field or spot somebody. And Van Slyke knew that. I always thought Van Slyke was a starter from the beginning anyhow, you know, so a um, full-time player. And he proved that later. But uh, Last thought, what about after you hit the home run? Did you ever have a moment or what did he tell you about that? How do you... How do you remember Whitey's interaction with that special Nothing, woman? nothing. There was nothing. You know, he, his mind was already going. He want, he's, the game's not over, you know, so he still had to get the matchup he wanted and had, you know, he had Daly coming in and, you know, he just, he, he's just there. And, and we all like that as professionals, you go in there, it's not over with, you know, anything could happen. It's not like we had a 10 run lead or something, you know, like that, you know, so um, we're playing on the road. They have the last at bat. They have a good team. And so you got to still get, you got work to do and get the job done. I don't remember him saying <laughs> anything. <laughs> to me or even seeing him like you know because I just um you just you know we weren't that way you yeah. know it, it was like unfinished business you know he was there because Gussie had asked him to please try to win him and could he could he could he win him another world series and he came we came close in 85 and 87 lost both game sevens um so we didn't quite quite accomplish that but I think that's where he his head was always at and he just wanted to he wanted to win and wanted us to enjoy in St. Louis and bring another championship to this this awesome city with these great fans. Did you ever let him know how much he meant to you in your career? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. I kissed him and stuff. He said, "Man, no kiss, they shake hands, you know, and stuff like that." I give him a hug or something at a card show or something like that, you know, and um you know, but he always says say little things like, I know when I know when you're hit because the ball makes a different sound when it comes off your bat. All these other guys are like bunch of Judy's. It doesn't, it doesn't make a noise when it comes off their bat. But that's I said he's like, that's what I want them to do. Hit the ball on the ground, run, and go with the percentages. And he says, I'll take it from seventh inning on after that and figure it out. You know, and I, I remember just a situation where I was hurt and I couldn't play and we were playing the Mets and Davy Johnson was over there and he asked me to come up. And stand, you know, come on the on deck circle like I'm pinch hitting, you know. And so the other manager made made a move to come get me as a right-hander, but he knew I wasn't going to hit, and he took me down the dugout and brought somebody up there like Braun or somebody that he really wanted. And he just was a little step ahead of the other manager, and you knew that before the game started, and you felt it, and you felt it from the other clubhouse. You, um, the other dugout. You felt that they, those players over that other manager knows somehow the white rat was going to outthink him, outsmart And you know some of the things he'd do. He'd take the pitcher and put him to war all out in left field, bring in Daly or Ricky Horton or somebody to pitch to a left-hander, and then go get him, put him back in, and get his best defensive guy out there. So he had his best defensive guy to try to end the game. And to get there, he trusted his people and players loved him for it you know it was just so much fun every day to go to it wasn't even going to work it was just going to a, a baseball game like a little league game or something every day it was so fun